Hey folks, welcome to the party. Um, so, uh, yeah, so that was, um, I enjoyed the discussion on Tuesday. I thought that was pretty interesting. Um, I thought you guys brought up some pretty good points um, about sort of how, to, how to interpret why nations fail. Okay, so we're gonna keep on, uh, keep up that pace with regards to reading um, and sort of periodically discuss uh, how things are going. Um, so I think we'll probably have maybe two or three more discussions for why nations fail, I guess, um, one, roughly once every two weeks. Okay, maybe maybe a little bit more. Okay, so uh, keep that in the back of your mind. Um, so the, uh, yeah, uh, I guess um, I was going to talk about the homework a bit today. Okay, I think it's probably good to go over this one um, in a little bit more detail. I know we've already gone over the Malthusian model quite a bit, um, but I think it's useful to lay out kind of what types of answers I'm expecting for these. So, I mean, a lot of the, a lot of these homeworks are going to be what I would call sort of problem set style homeworks, where I'm going to give you, you know, a particular model that's related to what we did, we are doing in class um, with some variations. Uh, so, and I mean, it's usually like a sort of forward part, um, uh, with the last one being a little bit more open-ended. So, uh, yeah, so I'll go through and just show you kind of what type of approach I'm expecting, okay, and how I usually structure the questions, and then we can sort of go from there, okay? Um, all right, so let me, I guess maybe I should, well, I'm going to mostly work on, on the, uh, just on, on hand-drawn notes here. So um, if you want to pull up the homework on the side, it may not be a bad idea, but I'll, I'll try and keep everything kind of self-contained here. Okay, so let's start a new page. All right, so this is, this is uh, first drawing white on white is not good. We need this problem set one. Okay, so I'm going to... I still haven't, sorry, I still haven't posted the actual written up answers um, onto the website yet. Uh, they're in my brain, but they haven't been fully put down on paper. Uh, so I'll put those up and then I'm, yeah, and then I'll have the graded versions. So we got a chat here. Uh, back to you on Tuesday. It is being recorded. Thank you, uh, Brendan, for checking up. Always good to check. So yeah, this is being recorded and we'll find its way into YouTube within, you know, 24, 48 hours uh, time frame. Okay. Um, yeah, I didn't put up last class. I mean, that was all discussion. So, um, sort of because I'm only recording what I'm saying, it would be an unusual, uh, I guess I do talk a lot, but still it'd be sort of an unusual, uh, thing to, to put up. Um, yeah, I mean, for those, it's more like interactive. You got to be there. So, um, and it's not stuff, you know, everything that's sort of critical for doing like the problem sets and all that. Is, is going to, you know, ideally is going to be in this kind of lecture and recorded. Okay, so that's that's how I'll probably do that in, in the future too. Okay. Um, all right, so then, so problem set one, uh, the first problem is, you know, it's pretty similar in a lot of ways to to what we did in, in class. Okay, it's sort of, a, in some sense, just a, a change up on this demographic function. Okay, so this is, Problem number one, uh, right? So the assumption in uh, class where we we're mapping from y to uh, gl, basically, I'll just write gl instead of l dot over l. Okay, so the assumption in class, you know, oftentimes, uh, at least, eventually, okay, was something like this. Okay, where we had. This, what I'll, on the left side, basically over here, we had this sort of Malthusian zone uh, where, you know, uh, higher standard of living, I don't know what happens down here, but higher standard of living leads to, to more population growth and that, you know, there's some intersection there with the zero rate where that was like the, this, the, the old Malthusian equilibrium. And then at some point you have this this other zone so after the demographic transition where, where it becomes the opposite where people where the population growth rate is lower for higher levels of income, which is more what we see in the modern world. Okay, so that that was like what I would call like the full, most realistic version. Okay, um, 
really what what problem one is just doing is, is we're more or less focusing on this this right hand side here okay um and so the the function that i gave you in problem one right it's, it's just sort of the algebraic way to write that out where it's gonna look something like this i'm gonna write just like a little y okay so gl was n1 the max of n1 and n2 minus little y so what is you know what's that gonna look like well um you know we have uh let's see n2 bigger than n1 right so at zero we're and we're assuming n2 is bigger than n1 i think i wrote that yeah and and those are both positive okay so n2 is bigger than n1 n1 and hence n2 are positive numbers okay so this is like zero here all right, so everything, it's always positive, which is a little bit different from what we have over here where it can go negative, all right? Um, okay, and then essentially what this is gonna be is at, at zero, right, this is the max of n1 and n2, which means that it's n2, right? So at zero, you're up here. As y gets larger, this is gonna go down, but then eventually you hit that n1 level and you're gonna flatten out, right? So in this zone, this is the n2 minus y, but then eventually you hit the level of n1 and so like this would keep going without the max but since we have that max there you can't go below that right so it's just going to be this for a bit then you kind of turn the corner right there okay so that's what that that uh function is going to look like and then we can sort of extrapolate that all right so that that the, the solid line is is what our is our gl function okay um it all means is you know it, it's going to look a little bit like this this is you know smooth smoother but um you know it's going to have the decreasing trend but it's not going to hit zero it's eventually going to hit some long run uh value okay and i'm just to label our axes here okay so yeah so that's that's the basic setup okay and and really with 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 doing these malthusian like sort of diagrams okay the, there's there's one really important equation which we we've, we've derived before, but it, it only takes a second to derive, so I might as well do it now too. Um, and you can get it by starting from our production function, which basically always is going to look like that. Okay, um, so that's aggregate production. All right, if we think about per capita, y over l. Okay, well this is going to be z k to the alpha. L to the minus alpha. Okay, we can combine those last two terms if we want, but we don't need to. Okay, and and then when we, you know, use our growth rate rules, which are super useful, I think, um, in in handling these types of functions. If we want to think, well, what's the growth rate of y? Well, then we can just we can just easily, you know, use the product rule basically and the power rule to say, okay, well, it's going to be the growth rate of z. Okay, from that first from this uh, first term over here. Then the growth rate of this k to the alpha term. Well, k is the amount of land, which we've always assumed is not changing over time. And it's st we're still assuming that, okay? So that that's not gonna contribute anything to growth because it's stationary. Um, and then the last term, the growth rate of the last term goes in. So that's L to minus alpha. So that's gonna be minus alpha from that power rule times GL. Okay, so this is like basically always true in any of the Malthusian models we're looking at, regardless of what we assume about this demographic function, okay, it's basically always gonna be true, all right? Um, and that'll, that'll, that's, yeah, that's, that's pretty much good enough for us. Okay, so, right, and, and then what, what that tells us is that uh, it, it, it'll tell us, right, so, so the, the, the fate of standard of living is just a, it's a battle between technology and population, which induces sort of like a density effect. Okay, so technology makes it better, obviously. Higher population makes it, it worse because of, of high, higher density. Okay, and these two are, you know, balancing off one another because there's a minus sign over here. Okay, wherever that is, there's a minus sign here. Okay, um, all right, and so then essentially, you know, if, if you want to say, okay, well, is GY positive, okay, that basically boils down to is GL less than GZ over alpha, right? So it's just rearranging this thing being positive it means if GL is low enough, right, then this GY is going to be positive, right? GL is zero, this would be positive for sure. If it was huge, this thing is going to be negative, right? So the question is, is GL 
small enough in this case less than that technological factor right and that's why we would go over here and say okay well, well suppose that gz was such that gz over alpha was here okay and then you could um i'll draw like a long dash line here um let's say that it was right there okay and that pretty much tells us everything we need to know right because there's going to be some intersection right and and whether you're whether you're on the left to, you start on the left or the right of this is is everything is determined from that right so you're going to start somewhere right you're going to have an initial condition which is your initial y your initial little y your initial standard of living and if it happens to be over here okay then population growth rate is relatively low relative to gz over alpha right it's, it's below gz over alpha and so then gy is positive okay so then you're gonna you're gonna move up in y space all right you move here and that's gonna be true anytime you're on the right hand side of that dotted line okay and you're gonna keep on going off to infinity okay that's pretty good in a normative sense I would say and like you know anywhere anywhere over on on uh, on this side here okay now if, if you do are unlucky enough to be start over here well then population growth is relatively high and you're actually gonna Keep on going this way and you're i mean you're gonna go to zero you can't go below zero but you're gonna head towards zero right so this is also zero here you're gonna head towards zero okay you know in in the malthusian world that we looked at before where you had that downturn at the bottom then then you would end up like here you, you would end up at a point that's not great uh sorry you would you would end up converging to this point which is not great Okay, but which is also not zero. Okay, so um, that's yeah. I mean, just because you don't have that lower end, basically, you don't you don't get the same outcome. But here, you're either going to go to zero or you're going to go out to infinity. So it's actually even more stark. It's like either you get longer in growth or you literally your society like collapses uh, because of extreme density. Okay, so that may not be realistic. I don't know, but um, that's that's kind of what the model implies okay so that's that's pretty much it and so so actually and the interesting thing is you know you think back to what we talked about with uh why nations fail you know one of their i think one of the most important um contributions or kind of ideas that they propose is this notion of a critical juncture okay where you have a event that sort of shocks the system this in this case the world or a set of countries and uh, the, the countries respond differently. Okay, so it sort of shakes things up and some countries sort of go up, some countries go down in terms of say political institutions or economic institutions, okay? Uh, some countries are like England sort of expand, uh, make things more ex in inclusive, so, whereas other, uh, other countries more in the, the Eastern Europe kind of double down on, on sort of oppressing the serfs and everything like that. So. Um, here you can see uh, this also gives you sort of something like a bifurcation right so um, you know uh, whether you're on let me actually point at this properly uh, whether you're on either side of this right is going to determine your fate okay and so if you just start here right then you're going to go to zero if you happen to start anywhere over here you're going to go off to infinity right um, but well, the question is, what you, we just show up someday and you're there, okay? But then had there could be the question of how did you get there? How, where did that initial condition come from? And one thing you could say is, well, maybe countries were just doing their own thing and there was a shock, right? So maybe there's, you know, countries were were somewhere over over here, say, and there was a shock and some countries got knocked all the way down here, like the the Black Plague or something like that. So that well, actually, that wouldn't work because. In the in the Malthusian world, plagues are kind of good for the people that survive. So, but but you can think about it uh, a technological shock, right? So it was a, a a natural disaster or something like that, right? Uh, or a climactic change that is not favorable to that country, right? Um, maybe you get pushed down here, whereas another country isn't so badly hit and they only get pushed down to here, right? And then if you look forward, well, the country that got knocked down below that that critical threshold is going to head down towards zero now. They've, they've been bumped into the bad equilibrium. The other country is going to continue on 
going back up to to a high growth regime. Okay, so you can see there it's you know you, you get bumped down into that bad equilibrium, and and because there's this just I mean it's literally a, a, a threshold creates a critical juncture and some could create a critical juncture, right? So it could create this bifurcation in the fate of, of countries. Okay, so it's interesting because this model, this sort of augmented Malthusian model, um, and that's that's going to be true of the one we looked at in class too, of this one, that it has it has a threshold. In this case, the threshold is right here, uh, where if you go below it, you kind of have a permanent and very different uh, change in your trajectory and end up with a very different outcome. Okay, um, whereas if you don't go below it, you're fine. Okay, so that, that, that actually is like sort of a very specific, you know, more mathematical description of, a, of an example of like a, a potential mechanism for a critical juncture. Okay, um, okay, so that's, I mean, that, that's pretty much, yeah, in terms of solving what, what happens in question one, I mean, that sort of describes it. I mean, you can, I drew it with like jumping, arrows jumping around, but you could also draw it as like a time path. Right, um, which is what I was asking for part C. Okay, um, all right, and then and then part D is uh, a little bit. So part D is the one where it's more kind of. There's no real right answer. There's there's it's open to interpretation. Okay, so it's, um, I don't want to give you the impression that anytime we have a mathematical problem like this, there's only one right answer. Um, that's kind of true for like parts A and B and sometimes C, but. Usually, at some point, it's more like, okay, well, what does this mean in the greater context? Okay, because we're really looking at um, it, these models are very simple compared to the world. Uh, so we're really looking at very crude approximations to the world anytime we have a model like this, right? Um, and for that reason, I mean, we kind of want to be cognizant of whether these assumptions are reasonable um, and whether they hold up in every potential outcome of the model, okay? And whether they might break down at some point, okay? Because um, a lot of models, they work where they're designed to work, but then when you when you try and sort of extrapolate them and push them into, take them maybe take them too literally or push them into a new regime where they weren't designed to, to be used, they kind of break down in ways that we can identify. Not, it's not like they're mathematically wrong, but they, they cease to be applicable to that setting, okay? So, um, yeah, uh, you see that, I mean, it's like, if, you, if you're following sort of the machine learning stuff, it's like we, people train data sets to uh, recognize people, but they only train it on people from one country. And when they try to use it on people, say, of a different race, they all of a sudden it doesn't work so well, okay, because they didn't train it on that. They should have included a, a potentially a broader set of data, right? So here, it's like, it's not like we're training per se, but we're thinking we're designing a model to, to apply to a, one particular setting and then maybe it breaks down. Okay, so what I'm trying to say is, you know, for part D, that's, we're trying to figure out, does the model break down conceptually? Okay, so, and, and since this is an econ class, we, we kind of think about incentives, okay? We think about, would people want to do something different? Or people in a, are, are the people in our model behaving in a way where they're leaving a huge amount of like money or utility or something on the table, uh, and they seem to be acting not rationally. Okay, so um, yeah, so that's that's what I want to get out of here. And so, so what I ask you, so this is this is like jump heads, so part D. What I ask you is to think about um, these uh, uh, R and W. So this R is like kind of the interest rate, but it's also sort of the the marginal product of capital. Okay, so the idea is. Um, in a competitive market uh, where you can like buy and sell land or where you can hire or be hired um, uh, labor, okay? Um, you In a competitive market, you would expect these prices, uh, in this case, the interest rate and the, the wage to look kind of like the marginal product of those factors, okay? So that's, that's kind of something that's true generally. If you have a competitive market, price should be equal to the marginal product. I'm sure you've you've encountered that a couple times before, uh, right? So um, in this case, we can think about the, the marginal product of land, okay? And since land is our notion of capital and the return on capital is basically the interest rate, I'm gonna call that R, all right? Um, and then we can also think about the wage, that's a little bit more, I think, straightforward. The wage is gonna be 
the marginal product of capital. Okay, so here I'm writing mar I'm writing the, the derivative of output with respect to capital, del y del k, or the derivative of output with respect to labor, del y del l. Okay, so and we we can I mean, we know how to take derivatives. We can do this, right? So uh, you know we got our production function um, up over here. We're just going to take a derivative of that to evaluate these. Okay, so this one is going to be the derivative with respect to k, right? So we're going to get what? We're going to get alpha z k to the alpha minus 1, l to the 1 minus alpha. Okay, so we're going to get a, a, a alpha term out front, and we're going to lose 1k. So that's why we have alpha minus 1, all right? And then, uh, and actually, if you think about it, the, just the way that the derivative works, it's like, Basically, you have alpha, you lose a factor of k relative to y, and so this is actually going to be alpha over k times y. Because right? when we take the derivative, we just pop off an alpha, and we decrement this by 1. So that's alpha divided by k times what we started with, which is y. Okay? So that's kind of, that's actually like, because it's Cobb-Douglas, that's, this, this functional form, is this is always true, basically. Okay? Um, now we can do the same thing for wage, okay, for the marginal product of labor. We're gonna, everything is the same except instead of alpha, it's one minus alpha, okay? And then we'll have z, k to the alpha, and now we have l to the minus alpha. Oh, I did that wrong. L to the minus alpha. So this, this is here, k is alpha, and then l to the minus alpha, okay, because we lose that uh, one here, all right? And just like with capital, so that means that this is 1 minus alpha over L times Y. Okay. Now, all right, so those, those are our, well, they're, what I would call them our factor prices. They're the, they're, they're the prices on, on capital and labor. They're also the marginal products because we assumed a competitive market for these factors. Okay. And so what is that? Well, why did we do that? Um, here's why. So... We can think about, I said, you know, I said we were thinking about, is this model breaking down conceptually? We can think about sort of a, some what if scenarios, right? So what if you're in a society like this? Um, and in particular, I'm thinking about the, actually the good version of this. So there's a lot of errors. What if you're in the, the, the zone where, you, where you, you're in the good equilibrium? You started with a high enough standard of living. The technology was not swamped by population growth and you had continual growth in that standard of living, okay? So y is just going off to infinity, okay? But also you can see along this, so this, this this just keeps going on forever, right? So y goes off to infinity. GL is basically equal to this N1, okay? At that point, it's, it, at, after this turn here, your population just grows at a constant exponential N1. So it's, it's growing, right, at an exponential rate, and that rate is N1. Okay, now, so what does that world look like? Well, technology is growing. We just exogenously, right? Um, because GZ is relatively high. Uh, population is growing, right? Density is getting higher and higher, right? Uh, it, it's, it works out that, you know, the, these relative levels here mean that you still have positive growth in the standard of living. Okay, so technology overcomes the... The density effect, okay. So you, you have a very dense, technologically advanced society with uh, continual growth in um, population, okay, and technology. So now, I mean, you what does that look like? I don't know. I mean, I didn't say that we're staying on the surface of the earth. Uh, maybe you have skyscrapers or something, okay, because you have a fixed amount of land, but you could maybe you have technology for building super tall buildings. That would be interesting, kind of cool, but perhaps you'd be missing out on, I don't know, just parks, greenery, stuff like that, right? So um, there could be some downsides. And so you might think that uh, you might you would want to find more land, right? I mean, if, if that was the world, finding a park would be awesome, right? Um, so, uh, and so that's, that's what I'm kind of thinking about here is like, if things are getting really dense, maybe people are going to start looking for more land, okay? And well, how do you think about that? Well, you need to know how va how valuable is land, okay? And that's the price 
of land, right? That's what I'm calling this R here. Okay, and, and the and the marginal product of land. Okay, so this is how, how how we would value that. Okay, and then you might think, okay, well then, what's the decision being made? Okay, well essentially, if you were a person there, you you could let's say you had it. I add something to the model where you could go and explore and try and find new land. So you build this ship or something, and you sail off, and hopefully you find something, right? Um, I'm not going to take a stand whether you're conquering or exploring. Sometimes those two blend into another, one another, but you're looking for more land, okay? And uh, let's say you, you have a choice. You know, if you if you go out and explore, then you find one unit of land which is worth R, okay? So your return would be R if you explore, okay? Versus uh, produce, basically stay stay where you are and produce, okay? Um, and there you would get W. That that's the weight. I mean, you, you work, you're a worker, you produce, so you're going to get W, okay? So um, yeah, so that that's that's your choice. And so the, the question is, which one would you want to do? Okay, um, capital or labor exploration or production, right? Um, and uh, yeah, so you can well, the, I don't know what the, which one is bigger. Well, um, you can think about the ratio of them. So the relative uh, by uh, relative return on exploration. Um, and think about it like this. You know, we have uh, R here, which we said was equal to alpha Y over K. W is one minus alpha Y over L. So we're gonna divide these because then the Ys are gonna cancel. Okay, so if we divide these two things, we're basically gonna get alpha over one minus alpha, right? From these alpha over one minus alpha, the Ys are gonna cancel and it'll get, the L is gonna kind of flip around on top. So it'll be L over K, all right? So it's alpha over one minus alpha, which is just some constant, right? And then L over K, right? So then the question is what's happening to this? Well, L is growing. We know that population is growing without bound and we know that K is fixed, right? So this thing is, is just going off to infinity, this ratio. So R is getting much, much bigger than W. And that means that basically you would want to go out and find land at some point. This place is getting very dense. You would want to go out and find land, which makes sense. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, that's pretty much it. Uh, because you have growth on L and K is static, L becomes super abundant, capital becomes super scarce, and so the return on capital becomes very high. And you would you would want to find more. Okay, so maybe it breaks down. I don't know. Maybe yeah, people will go out and look for more land. Uh, maybe there's competition for the same land between different people, different societies. Okay, so that's obviously a thing that happens. And so maybe you think that this, this model actually breaks down. Okay, um, that's fine. Okay, I mean, obviously it broke down at some point in the real world, so maybe that's good. Um, okay, so then, uh, yeah, so that, that, that that's my take on part D. I've, there, there's no, I would say 100% right answer. That, that's one answer you could give. Okay, but just I think the critical thing is thinking about this in terms of incentives, in terms of these values and, and prices, okay? And, and and thinking about whether this is a reasonable model. Okay, there are probably other reasons you can come up with why this is not a reasonable or is a reasonable model. Okay, so that's just one that I'm, I'm proposing. Okay. Um, all right, so I'll leave that, I'll leave it at that for, for problem one, okay? Um, and then we can go on to, to problem two if you guys are are okay with that. All right. Okay, so problem two. Problem two actually, I mean, it doesn't, I'm only adding one thing in problem two. Okay, which is this Z thing. Okay, so in problem one, we assume that GZ is constant. I think I, yeah, so I just said GZ is it which is z dot over z right i just said it was some constant in problem one given handed down from on high right so uh and now we're just changing that okay so here in problem two we're saying well now z is actually a function the how fast z is growing is a function of l okay so the the, the simple interpretation is that every person is just constantly thinking of some ideas maybe they're rarely successful, but they're successful at some rate, which is eta. And so the, you know, the more people you have thinking of ideas, the more um, 
good ideas you're going to have, and that's going to permeate throughout society and, and, and improve productivity. Is this Z technology parameter? All right. So, and and that that also means that bigger societies are going to have faster technological growth. Okay. So now that's good. Sure. Um, I mean that. And and so the question is, what? How do we think about this, and what, how is this going to change? Sort of the implications of what we found in problem one. Okay. Well, what I sort of try to guide you um, through here is is well, first we want to think about z, and we don't want to think about z in absolute terms. We want to think about it in growth rate terms. Okay. So we want to think about z dot over z. Okay. So if we just think about z dot over z, just divide that left hand equation by z, we're going to get eta times l over z. Okay. So that's going to be our growth rate on z. Now. What that means is if we want to have the z have a constant growth rate, we should have some proportionality between l and z, okay? And so the re the reason that arises is, well, first of all, algebraically, like, we have a ratio here. Anytime we have these ratios showing up in growth rates, we want them to converge. And, and so that means they should have the same growth rate, that l should be growing at the same rate as z, or vice versa, okay? But also, if you think about... Um, just, you know, this equation, what it means is that if you have a society with a very high population, okay, but a relatively low Z, okay, that means this ratio is high, which would imply a high growth rate of technology. So that means you have very, your, your technological, technological level is not very advanced. You have a lot of people thinking of ideas. And so proportionally, you're going to get a ton of growth right away. Okay. Eventually, it's going to converge down. As Z gets bigger, it's going to converge down to something. But you're going to get a lot of growth at that point. In the in the, the inverse example, where you have a very small population but really advanced technology, so you have like a small population, but also you have all of Wikipedia or something like that, okay, that you can read through. Um, in that case, you're not going to get very much technological growth, right? Because you have so much technology, you only have a few people thinking of ideas. Proportionately, they're not going to be able to accomplish that much, okay? So you're going to have a low growth rate. Um, and that, well, presumably that would converge over time if your population gets bigger, I guess. Um, but it might take a little while. All right. So, but, but, but in either case, you're going to have this imbalance between L and Z, which is going to lead to in one case, high growth and the other case, low growth. Okay. But if you, if you want to have a constant Z, then there should be some equilibration and some proportionality there. Okay. So that's going to, what, what that would mean here is that GZ should be equal to GL. So this, and remember, this is GZ is it's just this growth rate. Okay, so we should mention GZ should be equal to GL. Okay, the exact ratio we don't know, but over time they should be growing at the same rate. So that ratio is constant. That's all we need. Okay. Um, all right. So that's that's kind of what I the logic that I, that you want to employ is. Is thinking about when is th when are things balanced? When are things growing at a constant rate? Because that's at the end of the day what we're going to need for any sensible sort of outcome, All right? Okay, so that's interesting because let's recall before we we derived this uh, equation over here. Where to go? There it is. Uh, G this gy equation, All right? So gy, and that still holds here, by the way is equal to GZ minus alpha GL. Okay, we have that equation. And now we're saying that GZ should be equal to GL. So that means that G, we can plug in GL here minus alpha GL. Okay, and then we can combine these two into like a one minus alpha times GL. Remember alpha is less than one. Okay, so this thing is positive. Great, so that means that basically as long once we're in a sort of equilibrium or a steady state after a long time has passed we should end up with positive strictly positive uh growth in the standard of living because um essentially uh you know if you think about the case where gy got very low okay then I mean, it's it's just it it wouldn't be possible essentially because if GY got very low, 
right? That must mean that you had a relatively low level of technology, I guess. And then you would essentially from this equation, you would you would experience a high growth rate of technology, okay, which would put you back, okay? So in the long run, you're always going to kind of be pushed away from that bad outcome, right? By uh, improvements in technology, okay? Um, yeah, so then, you know, if you go back to this here, right? So here before, in question one, we had GZ was exogenously given. I, it was just some number which could land anywhere in here, okay? But now we're saying, okay, that GZ is gonna be equal to GL, okay? And that means uh, it's gonna be above, so it's, it's gonna be above wherever we're on this line. Okay, so it's, it's not gonna be like, so if GL was in the long run N1, okay, then uh, GZ is gonna be GL over alpha. So it's gonna be N1 over alpha. So it's gonna be something above that, right? So it's sort of like whatever GL we have, GZ is always sufficiently higher to induce growth. Okay, or it's equal and hence it's enough to induce growth. Okay, so if we end up at N1, it's gonna be N1 over alpha. Okay, and that's gonna push us out to that equilibrium. Okay, but, and if we were down here, it would, it would be N2 over alpha, which would be, you know, above N2, right? And it would push us away, it would push us up and, up, and off to infinity, okay? So it, it kind of pushes you away from that zero point. All right, so that's, that's the basic logic. Okay, it's not obvious actually. It was it's a little to me. It was a little surprising um, that you could eliminate the bad outcome so with the, with a relatively simple approach. Okay, so um, yeah, so that's that sort of. I mean, that's that's the basic outcome is that you kill off the bad equilibrium. Um, now, for as for part D, okay, in terms of the interpretational part, you can basically you can do the same thing that we did in question one, but this time with Z, okay? So you can say, what's, now think about do, the question of, instead of do I wanna explore for new land versus produce, you can think about do I wanna sit around and think of new ideas versus produce, okay? And so we're here I'm entertaining a world where you, you don't just randomly think of ideas, but you have to sort of sit down and you know study or do experiments pour various liquids into various beakers and see what happens. So you need to, to, to actively work and take time to, to improve technology in this what in the, this thing I'm proposing, okay? And so, um, yeah, so what is, it? the question is how, how valuable is technology, okay? And so for that, I'm gonna essentially use the same approach and say, well, what's the marginal product of technology, okay? Now the marginal product of technology, if you remember, so let's go back up here. Boom, look at our uh, production function. It just says a Z out front, right? So the derivative of that with respect to Z is just K to the alpha, L to the one minus alpha, okay? Which is equal to Y over Z. So it's just Y, but you lose the Z when you take the derivative because it's just linear in Z. Okay, so that's a relatively simple um, calculation, all right? Um, Okay, so that's I don't know I'm not I don't have a word I don't have a letter that I'm going to call that I'm just going to call it the Y L Z, and we can think about uh, remember the, what we found for the wage. For the wage up here, we found that it's one minus alpha over L times Y. Okay, so that's just the same that's the same calculation we did before. Okay. So now this is, but we're gonna do the same thing here. We're gonna say, well, you know, do we want to, I don't know what that, okay. Got a weird window, okay. Do we want to uh, do research? Okay, or experimentation, right? Which would give us del y del z, or do we wanna do production? Which would give us w. Okay, and so we're just gonna calculate. Again, we can just look at the ratio here. Okay, so del y del z divided by w, okay. Um, what's that gonna give us? Well, if, if you look at these 
two, comparing them. Although again, you have a factor of y that's going to cancel. Okay, so you're going to get a one over one minus alpha from this here. This is going to be in the denominator. Then you're going to get the y's are going to cancel, and you're basically going to get l over z. Okay, so here. Um, it's a slightly different outcome because before we had that R just was getting much bigger, much faster than W. Okay. Uh, whereas here we're, 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 we have L which is growing and we have Z which is growing and we're looking at the ratio and we actually showed before that they are growing at the same rate, that they should be growing at the same rate in the long run. Okay. So actually in this case, this thing is going to converge to some constant. They're in balance. Okay, the return on technology and the return on production are in balance. And the return on like research and, and production are in balance. Okay, so that's kind of good, all right? And that means that it, it's reasonable, I think, actually, that, that to have this production function. That, um, you know, if people were able to choose, do I want to be a researcher or a production worker, it w there wouldn't be an obvious answer. Okay, so, so maybe for some people, research is better, for some people, production is better, but they're, they're about on par. And so uh, there's going to be a, some fraction of people that are going to do research and some are going to do production, which you, you always need both. In any society, you can't get by on just research or just production you, if you want to have a good standard of living and have a continually growing standard of living. Okay, so you always need both. And so, so in some sense, this is, a, a reason, I would say, a reasonable assumption. Okay, so... There are other simplifications in this model, which aren't still good, but I, th I think this one is actually not a bad first start, okay? Um, and, it's, and it's relatively simple, and it, kill, and it eliminates an equilibrium, which doesn't seem, well, it doesn't seem good either positive or normatively. Um, it's your standard of living is converging to zero, your society is more or less collapsing, uh, and you don't see that exactly, I think. Um, Usually things equilibrate to some level, even if it's not so good, right? Uh, we got a question, okay. Um, if they grow at a constant rate, what does one over one minus alpha mean? Yeah, so now, so when, think of when we're evaluating, so the question was sort of if these are growing at a constant rate, sorry, if these are growing at a constant rate, you know, what, what is one over one minus alpha doing? So when you're thinking about, like, think, th you think about the growth rate of this equation, okay? Anytime you have a constant, okay, so alpha is some constant between zero and one, which measures um, how important is capital for production, okay? So usually we think about this as being um, about, about, we think about alpha as being about one third and one minus one, alpha would be about two thirds then. So this is just some constant, right? In this case, it would be about three halves. Uh, but in terms of the growth rates, these constants basically just drop out, right? So if, if you take the growth rate of this, well, that's the growth rate of this constant, which is zero, plus the growth rate of this, which is GL minus GZ. So that one over one minus alpha is, isn't going to affect the growth rate. It's going to affect the overall level of things, but it's not going to affect how they change proportionately because it, it is a, it's a multiplicative factor. So it, it's, it's, it's already proportionate, okay? So um, yeah, you, you don't need to worry about, about alpha. But um, but actually, th this this brings up something I did actually want to talk about. I, I just haven't found the right place to bring it up about this alpha constant, which which is we're seeing everywhere. So maybe I should tell you where does it come from. Um, well, it me so it measures how important is capital, right? And actually, the question one question you might have is, well, how do we know what alpha is? I mean, we're just, we just assume something, um, and it turns out. From just from this equation, actually, you can you can get a pretty good idea um, because if you rearrange this equation, so this equation says that W is equal to one minus alpha over L times Y. If you rearrange it and move that L over, then you get W L equals one minus alpha times Y, right? Or you can think equivalently W L over Y is equal to one minus alpha, okay? And so that's actually something that we can relatively easily measure, okay? Because what is it? It's saying, well, W times L, that's the wage times the number of people, which is the total amount of wages paid in the entire economy, okay? We can measure that. 
And then y is the, the total amount of output in the entire economy, another thing we can measure. And we can look at the ratio, right? So WL over y is the, total, is the fraction of output that goes to wages, OK? Turns out that we keep a pretty good idea of wages, and every, in, as a, especially as a fraction of output. And so we can, we can track that very well. It also turns out that that's pretty stable over time, right? So if you look in a given year, if you look at the fraction of wages that go to output, it, it's usually almost exactly 65% or about two thirds, okay? Um, it's, gone, it's gone down a little bit over time uh, for various reasons, okay? Uh, but it, it's usually very close to two thirds, right? So that means that this here, one minus alpha is two thirds, which means that alpha is one third. Okay, so we have a pretty good reason actually to think we know what alpha is and that it's one third, okay? Based on stuff that's kind of easy to measure, all right? Now, all these other parameters I'm throwing around maybe aren't so easy to measure, but alpha is, is actually a case where it's relatively easy to measure, okay? So, um, yeah, so that, that was an aside, not really to the original question, but I think it's good to get out of the way at some point. Okay, so, um, yeah, and so, and, and actually, the way that this this production function that we're using, which is called Cobb Douglas, kind of one of the reasons that it came about as as one that people started using more often is because it wasn't just theory driven; it was actually data driven in the sense that people looked at the data and says, "Oh, well, it seems like two thirds of the income, a product product of the the country or uh, of the U.S. And, and many other countries, about two thirds of that goes to wages almost every year. Like, is there some reason for that?" And then they found this production function where basically that happens exactly, okay? Uh, and we're like, okay, maybe this is a good production function. Okay, so it was kind of inspired um, by the data. It wasn't just completely fabricated out of thin air, right? Um, okay, so yeah, that was an aside. Now, uh, as for part D, so that's, I mean, as for part D, that's that's pretty much it. Uh, that, again, that's that's my proposed answer is that you can think about what's the marginal product of research in terms of technology, in terms of that derivative, that partial derivative, uh, compare that to wages and see how it works. Okay, so there's other ways you could think about it though. I mean, maybe here I'm assuming your research is purely labor driven, that you just need yourself and you can sit there and do, just think and that's it. We know that research is also, um, fairly often fairly capital intensive right so think about you know the big research effort going on right now or that well largely has happened already uh in terms of uh, developing and validating vaccines i mean that's it's labor intensive but it's also pretty capital intensive i mean you need machines to uh you know synthesize various things um to to gen to create mrna and all of that i mean i don't know the details but you need you know machines to do that in addition to people um, and then for testing you know we know that these uh, PCR polymer rea chain reaction machines are pretty awesome uh, but they're machines right they're, they're probably pretty costly um, and so you know that's that's another factor so so there instead of comparing it to the wage you might just compare it to to one in some sense because one is like the unit here we're like I, I haven't talked about this much but here are the, the price, we haven't talked about the price of, of Y, of goods, because we kind of normalize the price of goods to be one, okay? So here, so if you were thinking about research that was more um, resource rather than labor intensive, you might think um, compare one versus, uh, you know, del Y, del Z, okay? Or compare some fraction of GDP to del Y, del Z, which might give you a different answer. Or you could think about it more as comparing it to capital, in which case you would compare it to R. So it really depends on like, it's like opportunity cost. You, you do some research, but what do you have to give up? Is it, do you give up labor that could have gone to production? Do you give up capital that could have gone to, you know, like production uh, rather than research? Or do you give up just output? Okay, so that, that's not entirely clear. Um, but in this case with labor, you, you get a pretty clear answer, okay? All right, so that's that's the homework. Um, I think, yeah. So so I hope hopefully I give you an idea of you know there there's a method, okay, here uh, in terms of 
how to approach things, okay? Um, probably the most important part is for this class is thinking about growth rates and thinking about keeping things balanced, okay? Um, and being, you know, knowing how to use your rules for growth rates to calculate the growth rate of things, okay? Um, that's probably, yeah, so for this class, that's the most important thing. And then also the other thing is that there's, uh, that some, some of the questions are more open-ended and are open to interpretation, okay? Um, and so there's, yeah, I mean, don't, I think people worry for these questions that there has to be a single right answer and that's simply not, not always the case. Okay, so um, yeah. And uh, so I guess now I, I, we don't have that much time, okay, but I'm gonna sort of start talking about uh, uh, some, some additional material. Okay, and so um, I guess, yeah, so, and. So there's there's the the stuff that I want to go over uh, is there's a little bit more on, on sort of solo model related stuff that I want to cover. All right, so we talked at the end of the class before last class um, about human capital, okay, uh, and how to incorporate that into a production function, okay, and we also talked about how to how do you conceptually distinguish or differentiate human capital. Uh, from technology, okay, right? So human capital is a little bit more embodied, whereas technology was more sort of general uh, knowledge that's out there, okay? So, um, so I'm gonna. I, there's a little bit more I want to talk about there, okay? Um, but I think today I'm gonna I'm gonna transition into the uh, this lecture three, which is the the causes of growth, okay? So. Um, yeah, let's see, where should we go? So I guess, yeah, so let me let me jump over to the slides just so we can get there. All right, so um, uh, up until now, so th this stuff actually is, it, I would think about as sort of underpinning a lot of what, we, what we've been thinking about with uh, why nations fail, okay? Because they're, they're kind of proposing a mechanism for what causes growth and, and how that, evolves over time and how it varies from country to country okay um and you know we want to sort of validate that or invalidate it i guess uh we want to think about whether it's a reasonable mechanism okay um and also when we've been doing the solo stuff or even the malthus stuff uh we for the most part we've been assuming that the technology is exogenous okay that it arrives exogenously okay um and, and, you know, a big argument that why nations fail is making is that that's not the case, that technology arrives for reasons or it doesn't arrive for reasons, okay? And a lot of that has to do with the inclusiveness of institutions in the sense that when people come up with new technology, they may be prevented from sort of scaling it up or deploying it or something like that, okay? So we saw the case of, um, I forget where it was, some guy had an idea for um, making a better type of glass and the king just kind of killed him because uh, it maybe it was Rome, I forget. Um, and then there was another one which, which I think was less extreme, uh, perhaps a little bit more relatable where the, someone had come up with a technological innovation which was labor saving, uh, which would, you know, there was a, I, again, I forget what the, the application was, but it was, it would, it would have more or less put a good number of people out of a job by, by having an automated method for for doing something and the the emperor was like well that's gonna that that's not gonna be good for business my business you know politics uh, because a lot of people are gonna be out of a job okay so that's something we hear I mean automation you know that's a big worry is that automation is going to displace workers and they're not gonna be able uh, or not gonna have available to them jobs to get instead right so um, even though automation would improve productivity, you know, in some sense, if you look at productivity per worker, it would improve output, presumably it, w it would put a lot, it would potentially displace a lot of people. Okay. So, um, yeah, so the, so their argument is that, you know, the, the incentives for the creation of technology matter there. So if, if people think that, you know, if I come up with a new idea and, and propose it, then, and, the, and then I'm just going to be told that I can't do it. Okay. Then that, that isn't going to be good for 
technology. It's not going to be good for research. Okay, so um, we're not. I mean, we're not so used to that today in the U.S. I mean, I think there's a there's a pretty good amount of openness with regards to deploying new technology. Okay, but I mean, you know, it, that's not true in every case. Um, so if you think about probably one of the biggest examples in recent memory uh, is is ride sharing. So Uber and Lyft and and other companies. Um, well, I guess Uber was sort of the first. I mean, there, you know, you have um, a situation of basically regulated markets. So you have, uh, you know, a, a sort of an artificial limit on the number of cabs, right? You have to get a, a so this, this varies by city. So in New York, for instance, you need to get a medallion uh, to operate a cab and the number of medallions is, is a, f a fixed quantity by the city, I guess. Um, and the medallions are like really expensive and it's a very scarce thing. Um, and so, it, and, and the whole, the whole thing is fairly regulated, right? So, um, yeah, I mean, it's, I don't know, it, it worked pretty good. And I think part of it is that you want to reduce congestion. Okay. Uh, in the city. So there's certainly reasons for it. Um, and then Uber comes along and is like, actually, we're just going to do this thing. They kind of ignored the laws and like probably were breaking the laws. So there it was sort of like, there was a regulation, which was probably deterring people from entering, right? Uh, certainly deterring people from entering via the price of the medallion. Um, and then there was some new technology, which sort of somehow got around it and, and sort of a, something like a loophole, I guess. Um, and yeah, so in that case, you know, it's not clear. I mean, um, you know, th there was regulation, but then it wasn't really enforced somehow. So, but, but there are other cases where, you know, there are regulations. Uh, you know, if you think about, um, again, these, these regulations are often good. I mean, they're, they're often very good components to them. They're uh, consumer protection or something like that. But, you know, certainly like medical fields, you need to get things approved by the FDA. And that's, you know, I'm sure that's, there, there are many good reasons for that, right? So, um, but that does also make it difficult to enter those markets, right? Um, yeah. So, so, but there's a lot of examples, you know, so it, it's not the case necessarily in the U S that, that it's just any technology can deploy it anywhere, but it is relatively open, especially compared to these examples where we saw these, we saw before. Right. Um, and if you look historically, generally there was a lot more, uh, power sort of wielded by the upper class. So if you look at England historically, I mean, it was, um, that, you know, trying to set a maximum wage or something like that to keep the, the peasants in line after the, the, the Black Death. Um, and then later on, you know, when when they start handing out patents for things, it, it wasn't like today. It was more like it was more like a, just a government sanctioned monopoly. OK, and it would often go to friends of people in parliament who are, are usually lords anyway. So, um, you know, th things then were, were not quite as open. They were more controlled. OK often by the political elite. And so um, you know, it, it's certainly something that varies historically over time and, and across country. All right. So, um, yeah, so, so that, but that's their basic thesis is that we, you need to think about the openness to ideas and, and stuff like that. Okay. So uh, now the question is, can we, you know, how, how do we validate this in the data? How can we think about validating this in the data? Um, it's kind of tough. All right. Uh, but, you know, anytime someone proposes a mechanism that, you know, something is determinative for, for the growth of a country, um, you want to think, you know, sort of generally you need to think like, how, how are we going to assess this claim? Right. Um, and that, that gets to the, this question of, of causality. Okay. Of how do you determine that something causes something else, which is a pretty you know, sort of fundamental metaphysical question, I guess, but it's also something we think about a little bit more practically in the economic sphere and uh, econometrics, especially. Um, so yeah, so that's that's kind of what we're going to think about. Obviously, we're running out of time right now, but we're going to think about that, and that, that's that's sort of the goal of this particular lecture. Okay, so um, I'm going to skip this for now. Okay, and just just jump into causation. Okay, just to give you a general overview. Um, so yeah, you've probably heard. Correlation is not causation. That, that's kind of the basic takeaway here, but we're going to go into a lot more detail. Okay, so, um, but but it's it's important because it, it's important to, to determine causation, right? Because, you know, 
a lot of times you see uh, people saying that we should do something because it's associated with good outcomes. Okay, so the classic thing would be like, <clears throat> um, I don't know, there, there's many classic ones, but one one that I think of often is, you know, drinking two glasses of red wine a day is good for your health. Is Okay, so that comes from a, just looking at correlations, basically. Okay, so it's like, well, that seems like a lot. I don't know. It depends on, on who you are, I guess. But um, is, is that really causal or is it just correlation, right? Because red wine is something that's presumably drank by people that are relatively wealthy. Um, and so maybe it's just that wealthy people drink it and wealthy people have better access to health care and more ability to pay for it and therefore live longer. Or perhaps they have other, um, they exercise more or something. I don't know. Um, and so it's just correlated with, with wealth, which is correlated with health. And it's actually could even be bad for you, but it's just like it doesn't counteract the effects of uh, being wealthy. OK, so um, that's one example. You know, there's other stuff. You know, if you think about there's a lot of things that are correlated with uh, owning a house, with being married and all of that. Um, and, and that stuff is, is not clear. Is it causal or is it just correlation? Because right? those are things that are also correlated with wealth. OK, so and and once you got, start getting stuff like that, I mean, it, you know, and people proposing policies based on this, you know, if if it's a, a phantom correlation that doesn't indicate any cause of things, then the policy might not actually be good. The policy is, okay, now everyone has to drink two glasses of red wine a day. That probably wouldn't be a good policy, right? So, um, yeah, uh, you know, it's important to get it right because otherwise you're going to you're going to make bad policy. All right. And the policy is the only important thing in the world, but it's it's kind of important. OK, when you think about this and and when I say policy, it doesn't just it doesn't have to be government policy. It could be corporate policy. It could be you're a company. And uh, actually, a friend of mine, probably the last example I can give, a friend of mine works for uh, this company that sells uh, sporting equipment. It's backcountry. They sell like skiing and, and stuff like that equipment. Um, and they they had a thing where they would call up their best customers and just say like, hey, what's up? We thought you might be interested in this and so on. And they wanted to know, is that, does that work? Okay, and part of the problem is that you're already calling your best customers, okay? And so, you know, it's, it's hard to evaluate that, right? So, um, you know, and so to, to evaluate that carefully, you need to, you need to constrict, you need to take a more experimental approach rather than just this, call your best customers. And are they gonna buy stuff? Probably, because they've already been your best customers, right? So, um, yeah, so so it, it when I say policy, I mean not, not just government, but also any setting. If you're a business, if you're a nonprofit, if you're a government, if you're just sitting at home trying to think, what should I do today? Right. So it's going to be important in in any setting like that. Okay. So um, yeah, so I didn't get I didn't get to actually do or anything, but that's that's the motivation for why we should think about this. And so I'm going to talk about it with a bunch of circles and arrows and graphs, graphs in the sense of a network. Um, how to think about causation and how to uh, potentially infer causation from data and may, failing that, how to think about running an experiment to, to determine causation.